Hello there, a pleasure to see you here. Let us have a look at your reading, shall we? I've drawn three cards for you, and I've studied them closely. We have the Star card, the Eight of Wands, and the High Priestess. All three of these cards carry a spiritual cadence. It is very plausible this is what the reading is going to be about for the most part. Of course, the flesh and the soul are infused, totally, and one cannot be altered without the other, and vice versa. On the very surface of this reading, we see a hopeful nod towards a better, if not still unknown future. This future is promising, perhaps so, because it's still very much in the process of unfolding and expanding in ways we cannot understand quite yet. The middle card, Eight of Wands, with aspects of Mercury and Sagittarius, sparks the general sense of excitement of this change. And as you may look at the card, you can see that these wands are traveling up towards the sky. There's so much momentum born out of this hopeful experience that is to be seen within the star card. We can tie the Sagittarius aspect from the Eight of Wands to the star because of their inherent attitude towards the Creator and spirituality. Sometimes there are esoteric aspects of life that are better understood when they are experienced firsthand and in so many ways it is enclosed within these three cards that one is affirmed in their belief and they are convinced to follow the path, whatever that may mean to them, and they'll follow it all the way to the end. These are the gifts of hope and faith. Movement is insinuated, but not necessarily movement of the body, but most certainly movement of soul, and where the soul goes, the body will follow. This is not a paradox, and it explains why the cards are not revealing a materialized destination just yet. The High Priestess, the Star, and neither the Eight of Wands reveal an explicit material outcome. They do imply a promise. As seen in the Star card, the waters are poured on both water and earth, the pool implying a reflection born from the watery aspect of Chochma, divine wisdom. The ability to view Chochma, which is an unusual trait for a human to have, adds to the idea of possessing foresight. It is strengthened by the aspect of the High Priestess, who embodies the prophetess in material sense. We see a man moving out and away from the illustration in the star card. We see the Eight of Wands associated with Ninth House type of travel, meaning it crosses the borders. It is inherently transcultural and trans-ideological, with traces of Aquarius the water-bearer. And we see the High Priestess, who is sitting still, but underneath her stillness, she envelops the aspect of the letter Gimel. This letter is shaped like a foot, to walk, to go back and forth. Gimel is also associated with the camel, a hardy animal that is very capable of carrying people many miles across the desert. They're intelligent in managing their inner resources, our spiritual waters. Another aspect of Gimel is to lift up, as seen in the word Gadol, meaning high. So the implications is that you, the querent, are well equipped for a spiritual retreat, for transformation and an awakening. Wherever you are now, you will no longer be in the future. This change is onset. This is, among other things, what the card could say on the very surface. Let us examine the paths on the tree of life so that we may understand the cards on a deeper level. It is recommended that you have some basic understanding of practice of Kabbalah. These entail the study of the tree of life, the practice of Gematria, and detailed study of the scriptures. There are many detailed, well-written books for beginner, novice, and intermediate alike. It's very worth your while. The first thing that stands out is the uncertainty of the path of the star card. It sort of reinforces the idea that where one may go is still uncertain, and through learning one may consider other viewpoints. The reason for this uncertainty that sometimes feels like a crossroads when reading tarot along the path of the Atzheim is because Aleister Crowley was of the opinion the emperor was better off on the path of the star, of Tsari. And this is important because the implication is that of the priest king, or also Melech Tzedek, and the star on the path of He, for the consideration of it being offered a window into the secret of creation, 
this experience is so profound and life-altering, it tends to happen when the ego has fallen and one can look up with momentary clarity and gaze into the face of God. According to Kabbalistic teachings, only very few people were capable of achieving such a state. And one of these teachers was, in fact, Moses. The temporary eradication or the correction of the ego is necessary for the emergent experience depicted on the star card. A tzaddik, meaning the righteous, is considered the path of a prophet and is uniquely blessed by the creator. More commonly, the tzaddik is a trait hidden within the people that you will meet in this world. As they say, the vagabond may as well be a tzaddik, and so Kabbalah urges its practitioners to remember humility when meeting another person. The world of spirituality doesn't follow the rules and trappings of the mundane world after all. A spiritual hierarchy doesn't necessarily reflect in the material world. A simple blue-collar worker may be a tzaddik and a CEO may be a lost soul. According to the teachings, these hidden tzaddik are paramount to the continued existence of the kingdom and without these good souls the world would be doomed to collapse. This may also be a particular message to consider that spiritual wealth does not necessarily reflect material wealth, that leading a mundane life and not the fast life is a totally viable option. In society, there's too much emphasis on the gathering of material wealth and the powers and responsibilities that come along with this and sometimes end up abused. A common man or a woman is looked down upon even though these are the people that make the world go round and ensure the future of any given civilization. The silence encased within the high priestess card needs to be considered very carefully when viewing our material reality. The letter Kimmel, as mentioned earlier, can be associated with the camel. However, it can also mean lift up, evident from the word kadol, meaning high. This is a considerable title in religious Jewish community, and it shows why the Golden Dawn chose to see this letter attached to the High Priestess, a mysterious figure holding in her hands the key to all esoteric teachings, the Torah. If this is something uncomfortable to you as a reader or a viewer, it is entirely fair for any tarot reader to tell you that the tarot keys were designed around scripture to begin with. It should be given equal weight, if not more. Another thing that the High Priestess teaches is that humility is important. The High Priestess is most revered. To insinuate one knows more than her is a foolish take. Her greatest asset is that of silence, or more correctly, the speaking silence, or the chasmal. The aspect of glory is somewhat puzzling to me. I would not consider myself having mastered the Kabbalah. I do know that glory relates to hold. Because this is already translated by Arya Kaplan, and glory is written with a capital, it's very probable it is talking about the Svera Hod. This one represented within the reading by the Eight of Wands, so the presence of this place is palpable in that regard. But its placement from Keter to Tiferet and vice versa from the point of view of man makes little sense. In the Gra version, Gimel, or the Thirteenth Path, is situated between Chochma and Chesed. Chesed, or with the letter Gimel, Gedula, shines directly into Hod, so to speak. However, in the version of the Ari, the thirteenth path is situated on the opposite end of Bina and Gebura. It traverses the pillar from one end to another. It settles on the pillar of mildness in the Golden Dawn version. There is a slight irony to it for what the letter entails. It actually moves back and forth. We obtain knowledge and experience through moving away from and back into safety. A child will begin to try and take a few steps further away from their mother and then come back again. Then eventually the time will come when they will attempt to move around the corner, breaking line of sight entirely, and then return to process what they've learned and experienced. They will tell their parents of what they've seen and carefully observe their responses. Everything is placed in some form of context this way. This is a very tentative and important process for both child and parent. Of course, it is best to figure out a good balance of freedom and restriction during these explorative times. And so the aspect of Gimel is there to remind oneself about how we spend our lifetime learning new things. 
hold our glory is most definitely the place within the tree of life where we break things into smaller contextualized pieces of information here we can craft our philosophies our scientific theses and any and all other theories we have a very good mental grasp on the things we encounter in our lives in this particular field there's more activity within this receptive sphere than in, B than in Bina, its mother, because it is infused with the active principle of chesed. You could say that there's a good balance between openness and restraint in order to develop and learn. As the past suggests, there's little to no contention about this one, although the Golden Dawn version is slightly tweaked from the rabbinic interpretations. It's a fixed sphere that, unlike the other 22 Hebrew letters or building blocks doesn't really move about within the tree of life. This sphera is blessed with the ability of gaining understanding through Gedula and through the mirror of Gedula appear into the cosmic blueprint, Bina. It has quite a religious undertone, but the Kabbalah was developed during a time that science and divinity were wholly intertwined. It is best to approach this sphera as intended by pondering upon scripture and the sciences simultaneously. It will become clear to any discerning and rational mind that neither religion nor, nor science are opposing forces. But rather they complement one another, much like philosophy creates a firm basis from which we could deduce our surroundings with structured and clear rhetoric. Organized thinking, lucid thinking, both are key to this sphera. This practice may, as Descartes in his reading suggests, lead to a very surprising breakthrough. The number 8 in Kabbalah goes beyond that of the perfected and created number 7. It implies that it's beyond the realm of creation, beyond the kingdom. It reaches further and closer to God, whom has no dwelling in this world, Eretz, but he does beyond it. The practice of faith on the earthly kingdom is considered somewhat impersonal and distant from our Heavenly Father, but within the metaphysical aspects of the number 8, the worship and our relationship to Adonai has the ability to become more intimate and meaningful. The number 8 is best explained through the expression of the 8th Hebrew letter, namely Chet. It is shaped like a little fence, creating a boundary between what is known and what is unknown, between what is safe and what is dangerous, between what is material and what is immaterial. It is a common practice to research overarching meanings through the study of words, and for Chet you can find a word such as Chaya, one of the five soul expressions in Kabbalah, corresponding to the world of Absolute, the highest expression visible still on the tree of life. If we move beyond that, the scholar speaks of Yechida. Chaya means a living one. The Chayot refers to living creatures from Ezekiel's vision. They are visible in the 10th and the 21st tarot keys. Chaya also makes up the word Chaim, meaning life. And another important influence to consider is that of Chesed, the fourth sphera of the Etz Chaim, the tree of life. This word means loving kindness and it relates to an aspect of God, but it also reveals an expression of mankind. As considered on the tree of life, where the vertical distance is very important, the further one moves away from the crown, Keter, the more evil, meaning removed from God, and the more volatile the material becomes. As the fourth sphera's chesed is considered closer to God than it is to man, just like Chaya is a higher octave of the soul, chesed is a higher octave of our collective humanity. In the Golden Dawn version, the Hebrew letter Chet is associated with the chariot, and its traditional meaning is not so much physical movement, as is sometimes implied within the mundane, but it is a spiritual quest. In Crowley's deck, we can see the charioteer turned into a grill knight, holding the holy grill within his lap. In other words, one does not have to move physically in order to travel in the Merkaba, the chariot, meditation and contemplation are the important aspects of progression, that is the key. Chet also relates to the word chokhma, meaning divine wisdom. It is the watery aspect of deep inner reflection. This state of mind is not easily achieved, if at all, and so this wisdom comes almost always clothed within understanding, bina. 
Code, under Bina's umbrella and part of the similar expression on the Pillar of Boaz, is the tactical sphere of conceptualizing things. Here we formulate our sciences and our philosophies. It is here we craft our theories and metabolize our understanding. This before folding it either further upwards into areas lesser understood by the human mind or psyche, or we put them to use in the mundane world where we can engineer our lives accordingly to what we know. Within this reading, it is enclosed that this is a consciousness falling upwards, climbing the tree through deeper understanding and unraveling earlier known truths and falsehoods about existence itself. This is a path that is not easily defined, just as much how the meaning of life is not to be understood or how the essence of God cannot be held in its totality within our mortal gaze. It is an ever unfolding journey of discovery a hall of fragmentary pieces making up a greater truth in its totality. It weaves a picture separate from existing societal beliefs, rife with confusing contradictions and existing and complex duality. From our earthly vessel we gaze upwards to a place far removed from ourselves so that we can learn how to relate to God in the heavenly realms. The dichotomy is inherently within us, like soul and flesh is inherently part of us. To summarize the reading in its totality, it speaks of a process of obtaining new experiences as an active principle rather than a passive one, meaning one seeks new territory in conscious effort, then metabolizing said experiences and finding wisdom and understanding as one moves to and fro between active and passive principles. This is a type of world building on working actualities. These working concepts are directed and used in tactical fashion to build ourselves up. It is a consciousness folding upward, so it is inherently constructive rather than restrictive or downright destructive. We're opening up our minds in this reading. We're, we're unfurling like a flower, because that is ultimately also the point of practicing spirituality, we're not becoming more dense by the gravity of the materialism throughout the years in our lives, but rather we climb a trellis of heightened understanding. And in Kabbalistic terms, this means we climb closer towards God. If you found this reading and you've made it this far, thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments. Uh, like it if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it, and perhaps until next time.